Previous generations of disenfranchised Roman Catholics forged a deep footprint. They were like martyrs without shedding their blood. Unsung martyrs who built many of Kentucky's 19th century places of worship. Their contributions came with a very heavy cost. Bishop Joseph Rosati of St. Louis owned slaves. Bishop John Mary Oden of Texas owned slaves. As did Kentucky's earliest bishops who participated in bartering and owning human lives. Their names appear on prominent statues and grace the entrance of a well-known high school that had to shut its doors. What a tradition, what a fabulous history that that school has. Rural traditions found their way into the state's biggest urban center. African-Americans who were on Catholic plantations, they wanted the same thing. And Louisville was kind of like the place to go if you could get there. Many of the faithful did not flee their belief system. They had to have a strong faith to, to endure what they did. Endurance was perhaps inspired by a 19th century newspaper man decades ahead of his time. He spoke out when transportation did not include fairly people of color. Daniel Rudd's vision from the 1800s has its place in the 21st century, considering the sacrifices came generations before. For black Catholics, it was just pay, pray, and obey. Sacraments are an important part of this ritual, but along the way, there are things that seem to be forgotten. Hello and welcome, I'm Steve Krupp. This is a story of history, heritage, and hardship. Going back to the late 1700s, the earliest settlers in the Commonwealth of Kentucky expanded the reach of the Roman Catholic Church. They carried their faith into parts of the South as well as America's heartland. However, the contributions of one group appears to be missing. We're talking about African Americans. They were builders and caretakers, parishioners and worshipers. Understanding what they did, how they lived, and the sacrifices they made means coming to grips with facing an uncomfortable truth by connecting bluegrass roots and Catholic realities. Bardstown, Kentucky, population just a little more than 13,000. Overflowing pride comes from deep connections linked to centuries of distilling high quality bourbon. Much in demand whiskey exported from the seat of Nelson County gives this community the title of being known as the undisputed bourbon capital of the world. However, another hometown fact boldly shapes the narrative of American religious history. Bardstown is also home to a significant and revered place of worship. The Basilica of St. Joseph's is America's first Catholic cathedral west of the Alleghenies. Built back in the 19th century, this revered structure remains a noted place of worship in the center of town that's held in very high esteem. Hey, Walks away, one signature event with ties to the church has been carried out for more than two decades. Linked by faith, family, and a full weekend of festivities, this popular seasonal event known as Buttermilk Days attracts the masses. It starts with a morning breakfast and... Before the night is over, a big street festival keeps the sidewalks packed and people on their feet. They always come back to their roots. Blocks from the cathedral, the roots of this annual gathering are firmly connected to St. Monica's Catholic Church. Well into her 80s, Carrie Stivers remembers the formative years of the new doors being opened at St. Monica's, which is named after a black patron saint, as a means of giving African-American Catholics a parish they could call their own. You wanted to be active. You wanted to be more than just the cooks that help with the picnics. You wanted to have to make the decisions in what was going on. And so that, that 
was in the minds of some of our forefathers. History has a way of telling its own story. Such a compelling narrative and definitive story chronicled by Nathaniel Green is titled The Silent Believers. First released in the early 1970s, Green's account spells out the challenges and obstacles endured by Catholics of color in the bluegrass state. Catholics, like the other religions, uh, fell into this law of uh, supporting uh, slavery and uh, segregation. The church was trying to survive in the religious environment that they found themselves in Kentucky. In the state central region known as Kentucky's Holy Land, which is made up of Nelson, Washington, and Marion counties, houses of worship and final resting places offer a compelling timeline. I feel like that I'm here because of my ancestors, you know, because of their spirit. And, and I want to continue that. And I want to pass that on to my children so that they can understand that, you know, it's important to embrace who you are and, and your history. The formative years of this faith in the Bluegrass State are connected to the trail of history emerging from Maryland's largest city during the 18th and 19th centuries. Baltimore historically was the first diocese established in the U.S. But that's not to say it was the oldest on these on, in the uh, New World. The first group of, of persons that call themselves Catholics that came to this, this country, what we now call the United States, they landed in Maryland on March 24, 1634. Steeped in the roots of American Catholicism, Baltimore is home to the nation's first Roman Catholic cathedral where construction began in 1806. Officially known as the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, builders finished their work in 1821. In 1808, the Catholic Church had expanded beyond just Baltimore, and so they decided to come up with four new uh, dioceses, four new hubs of Catholicism, and they were New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Bardstown, Kentucky. In one of his academic writings titled, Catholic Slaves and Slaveholders in Kentucky, Dr. C. Walker Goller of Xavier University of Cincinnati writes, during late March of 1787, a band of warriors on 18 Mile Island just above the falls of the Ohio fired upon a flatboat of Maryland Catholics. An ounce ball ripped through both thighs of Thomas Hill while another bullet took the life of Hill's property, a black man. His name was not recorded. Bardstown by far had more Catholics and covered way more land. It, it basically was all of what, all the known United States west of the Allegheny Mountains was in the Bardstown Diocese. And Bishop Benedict Joseph Flaget was put in charge of all that. Bishop Benedict Joseph Flaget bears the distinction of being Kentucky's first Roman Catholic bishop. Flaget arrived here, 1810. 1811, he is uh, passing his paper around about building cathedral and things. We're going on with the idea of uh, Bardstown was centrally located for the local parishes. Twenty years before St. Joseph's Cathedral opened and Bishop Flaget welcomed parishioners, 11 miles south of Bargetown, near the community of Loretto in Marion County, Holy Cross Church served as the primary place for growing the denomination. Founded in 1792, it is among the state's oldest places of Roman Catholic worship. While the current structure points to the fact that it was built in 1823, this memorial recognizes where the first church stood on these grounds charged with the responsibility of expanding the base of worshipers. Father Stephen Badden, who's been described as the Apostle of Kentucky, arrived in the so-called Holy Land during 1793. Badden was the first priest ordained in the U.S. by America's first bishop, John Carroll of Baltimore. Many people saw that Badden had a very difficult life. I mean, he, he was a minister. He wanted to bring salvation to people, but he also had to have food on the table. So many Catholic women and men donated help to him in, in the terms of slaves. 
Eventually, he became an owner of slaves. He, at one point, he owned 10 different slaves. The Lord be with you. Coming to grips with the factual indignities of the faith he practices is an awakening journey for Father Anthony Chandler. How you feeling? This you Louisville, Louisville native has pastored several parishes in rural Kentucky. And of course, we're already a little shuddered by when we hear Catholics that had slaves. Well, that's, that's certainly a reality. Oftentimes when, when estates were settled, you know, slaves would be given to, you know, to uh, these religious orders. A young man or young woman enters the convent or enters the Jesuits, and as part of their dowry, they bring a slave. One group benefiting from free labor was the Sisters of Charity. Since 1812, they've called Nazareth, Kentucky home. We were a community of religious women teaching young girls, so we needed lots of help. There were slaves and the sisters were trying to get ahead and, they, and our people were manpower. We have two buildings that they helped to build. The bricks were handmade from clay here on the property. And one of them is our beautiful church and the other one is O'Connor Hall. I think it speaks more to the mentality of the white slave owners and, and in this case the nuns and the priests uh, that it does African Americans. Tributaries like the Rolling Fork River, Cartwright's Creek, and Pottinger's Creek are among the earliest settlements for pioneering members of the faithful and their so-called property from Maryland. It was defined what we were going to offer as far as white people were concerned, as far as people who were in authority was concerned. That was what we were going to offer was defined and that meant bricks and mortar. While dated reminders hint at labor and laborers at these historic structures, coming to grips with the past opens a torrent of scattered emotions. You know, I had, you know, some inkling that, yeah, slaves probably built, you know, these churches. My people helped build those churches but a part of those churches, went to mass there, said prayers there, baptized there. Most notably, Bardstown's famous Basilica of St. Joseph's. One of the gentlemen who was a brickmaker, he, he had promised for his servant, he called, for his servant, he and his servant would make the bricks and would have them available. You had skilled African-American enslaved people that were skilled masons, carpenters, house builders. If you look at it in that context, it, it makes those buildings even more sacred as places of worship because there is that blood, sweat, and, and in many cases tears that is what led to those uh, edifices existing today. During the years this faith expanded in Kentucky and elsewhere, something unique was happening back in Baltimore. Women of color answer the spiritual call to serve in an organized fashion. Here you have something that's just almost unthinkable that you would have a religious order, women of color in, in the habit when they're living in a slave state. And the mindset of many people is that, you know, they may, that black people may not even have souls. First organized in Maryland during 1829, the Sisters of Providence, also known as the Oblate Nuns, are still a functioning order. Its founding leader was a Haitian immigrant by the name of Mother Mary Lang. She was a free woman in a slave state. She was a woman in a male-dominated society. She was an immigrant woman in a nativist country, and she was a Catholic woman in a Protestant country. So you have four strikes against you. Our mission is to be of service to God's people. More than a century and a half later, the order remains viable, and for several years was headed up by Superior General Sister Mary Alexis Fisher, who believes lasting strength comes through suffering. We as African Americans, look at our history. You know, slavery. I mean, that was no picnic. And yet, we are a strong people. Monuments across the South honor soldiers who contributed service and sacrifice during the Civil War. By the time this conflict exploded on American soil and divided the country, power shifted to a new cathedral in Louisville that opened during the 1850s. Bishop Flagey died in 1850, 
and was replaced by a cleric who, despite his controversial views, became one of Kentucky's best known bishops. Martin Spalding was a complex figure. He was born in 1810 down in the Catholic Holy Land of Kentucky, born to a slaveholding family. While battlefield flashbacks offered stirring reflections from the 1860s, another conflict at the same time was underway here in the U.S. This skirmish went all the way to Rome and was carried out by American church leaders who boldly defied the Vatican. When you look back historically, there was no such thing as telephones. There was no such thing as, as, as the media operations and communication systems that we have right now. So the question for me often becomes, how much did Rome really know firsthand? 22 years before the first shots were ever fired at Fort Sumter, Pope Gregory XVI penned these words during 1839, saying, quote, to turn away the faithful from the inhuman slave trade in Negroes and all other men. What's in the church is in society. What's in society is in the church, whatever church. And uh, it's something that we're always battling. Compelling signs showcasing the sales of individuals and newspaper accounts of cash rewards for their capture all loudly underscore how the Pope's words didn't resonate with American church decision makers. In his book detailing the life of Patrick Lynch, Charleston, South Carolina's third bishop, Dr. Stephen White points to the fact that American bishops look the other way despite orders from Rome. In order to be accepted and assimilated into Southern society, you could not upon, oppose the institution of slavery, at least publicly. Publicly is how Martin J. Spaulding defended a widely criticized practice that is now illegal. He grew up with slaves. That was part of his reality. Spaulding opposed President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and served as the Archbishop of Baltimore during the closing years of the Civil War. He claimed that Catholics were working on gradually emancipating slaves by giving them education and giving them skills. Bishop Martin J. Spaulding's 1863 dissertation on the American Civil War has been analyzed by church scholars. The document delivered to the Vatican refers to liberated slaves as miserable vagabonds, drunkards, and thieves. He also writes, those who are freed and head to the north, almost all, at least their children, become Protestants or else indifferent and infidel. Being a Catholic is, is about um, one of our basic social teachings is about human dignity. So it's hard to wrap your head around all the, the, the darkness of it. April 1865 brought an end to the four-year conflict that claimed hundreds of thousands of lives when Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Union General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox, Virginia. Clearly, Lincoln's emancipation didn't guarantee equality, even in the eyes of the church. However, freed individuals who built these places of sanctuary refused to let go of their faith. Survivors of the Civil War era were forced to put their spiritual values under a very precise microscope. You have to ask yourself, why on earth would you want to stay in a church that subjected you to that level of racism? African Americans kind of understood where they were, but a lot of this was due to the fact they were hunting for a place to land. They were hunting for a place to land so that they could claim themselves as being free, independent people of dignity. Dignity and the prospect of hope blossom from the belief of making a life in the new big city. Long before Louisville was defined in part by Churchill Downs and Slugger Bats, commerce along the Ohio River fueled the city's economic engine. They took their faith with them exactly. And um, without any priests, by the way. Faith went on the journey for thousands of African Americans, searching for a better life through a collective exercise known as the Great Migration. Many of the early black Catholics in, in Louisville and Kentucky in general were uh, individuals that made a conscious decision to continue the faith of their former 
owners. I see how so many were martyred, but these people, they were martyrs of, of physical strength and personality. They suffered, they were pushed down, but at the same time, you're not going to hold me back because I'm going to build me a church. I'm going to get me a church I'm gonna, that I can worship in. And when I look around, I see somebody that looks like me. New opportunities did come by getting to and worshiping in Kentucky's largest city during the 1800s. At many churches, a less than level playing field clearly existed in the 20th century. The body of Christ. Father Giles Conwell is a Louisville native who entered the seminary at age 14. Despite years of leading masses around the country, he and his family would experience church order discrimination at one well-known parish in the city's Limerick neighborhood. The uh, first time I saw my mother crying was when an usher at St. Louis Bertrand told us we have the colored pews in the back. And that's when I saw my mother crying. Right here in Baltimore, our sisters right down at the Basilica had to sit. They were not able to sit in the front pews. When the sisters went down south, uh, they were expected to sit at the back of the church and receive communion after everybody, after the white parishioners had received it. Some of the sisters were de denied Holy Communion because they, the priest would not give it to them. Blacks did worship in the back of the churches. Uh, uh, they contributed to the uh, uh, church financially uh, and separate records were kept. Such a commitment to service is well documented in the holdings at the Library of Congress. Images from the 1930s detail the contributions of African Americans at a church-sponsored picnic at Bardstown's St. Thomas. We just, uh were not respected. We had to stay on the uh, left side of church. Uh, we received communion on the left side. The only time that we re went to the main altar in the center was when we made our first communion. In this great white church, St. Joe's Cathedral, that our great, great grandfather helped build as a blacksmith in that church, we were still treated as less than the other folks, but we knew what the great prize was. The great prize was the body of Christ. Many black Catholics compared their circumstances to those seeking change during the lunch counter protest of the 1960s. Now it's not just the little old five and 10 cent store, the little soda fountain that you couldn't sit at the stool, but it was your church. Part of that comes from, of course, the whole Jim Crow realities that existed, even in the church. We, we don't want to talk about that. For decades, African-American parishes across Kentucky's largest city have delivered a powerful and soul-stirring soundtrack. However, for this group of Catholics and their families, discovering one's own voice required navigating a series of carefully guided baby steps that broke new ground. It was simply a faith-based journey. We were looking for something better. They wanted to be active parishioners. They wanted to minister in the church that they weren't allowed to do. Near the corner of 13th and Broadway, St. Augustine's, named after one of the church's first saints of color and son of St. Monica, has been home to black Catholics for more than 140 years. However, services were first carried out in the basement at Louisville's Cathedral of the Assumption prior to African-American worshipers establishing a place of their own. So they go to the cathedral and it is established. The coloreds will go, they'll have that little church in the basement of the cathedral. I think they were coming from something to something. It was not just spiritually, it's socially, economically. They were just looking for a better life. The faith that they had with them there, they brought here. The relocation of black Catholics from Kentucky's Holy Land meant a second church would open in a growing city. 
Beginning in 1907, St. Peter Claver, named after a Jesuit priest and patron saint of slaves in South America's Colombia, became a fixture in the Smoketown community. A letter from St. Catherine Drexel revealed that she provided help for the parish in its formative years. Discovery for this group of believers was not confined solely to the Commonwealth's largest urban center. I see in Lebanon, St. Augustine's was on this side of the street. Directly across the street was St. Monica, the black church. Separated by concrete sidewalks, a paved street, and St. Augustine's towering steeple, St. Monica's in Marion County was the first rural parish for African Americans that opened in 1914. It would close in 1962. But the just one, because of his faith, shall live. Word of the Lord. Thanks, God. Ten miles away from Lebanon in Springfield, a similar idea was carried out. Dedicated in 1929, Holy Rosary meets the mission of fulfilling the needs of African American parishioners. New members came from nearby St. Dominic and St. Rose which has the reputation of being the first Catholic educational institution of higher learning west of the Alleghenies. A roadside sign mentions that Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, was a student here 50 years before the Civil War ended. Yes, God is real. Pamela Spalding Grundy remains a lifelong member of Holy yes, Rosary, who embraces her family's contributions. I know that my daddy carried bricks to put this building together. During the mid-1950s in Bardstown, a second St. Monica's Parish would open. They wanted to free their spirit. There was no way to do it in the Catholic Church. At St. Monica's, Father Michael Lally would provide meaningful support during the early years. That was also the case with Father John Lancaster Spaulding at St. Augustine's in Louisville, who would later become a bishop in Peoria, Illinois, and Father Simon Grisham at St. Peter uh, Clinton. Again, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The 1950s also brought a Macklin Heart of Mary to the city's West End. It was the boyhood parish of Atlanta priest Father Giles Conwell who remains proud of the parish's growth. So we're finding our voice and it's being spread so much better and more effectively in this age of uh, communication. Enhanced communication emerges through a sense of identity with defined purpose. St. Martin de Porres opened its doors at 32nd and Broadway in 1991. Named to honor the patron saint of mixed race individuals, it is a place where Deacon James Turner and his wife Annette, who heads up the Archdiocese of Louisville's Office of Multicultural Ministry, are often seen. The church was a way of life for us because to be Catholic, period, and black, and Kentucky was rare. For many documentary filmmakers, there's a close connection to the projects they pursue. What you're seeing is one such example. This parish, Our Lady of Consolation Catholic Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, has been my parish for the last 30 plus years. But there is a deep connection to Kentucky's Holy Land that goes back some five generations, which in this case, makes the story very personal. The only known Kodak moment of the Crump family, our family, can be reduced to this single image. My mother Joyce and father Jimmy parted ways early in their marriage, but not before I received the sacrament of baptism from Father Angelus Schaefer at St. Peter Claver. By age six, both First Communion and Confirmation came at St. Paul's Catholic Church under the watch of Sister John Mary, who later left the convent, but remained dedicated to the faith and retired as a Catholic school instructor. Today, she goes by the name of Rita Hanwinkle. As you get older, you look back and you wonder, how did I do it? We were at our comfort zone with the children. I felt that those children loved me, all of them, no matter their color or whatever. Absolutely, we did. 
My first great experience came in this integrated environment and began days after the March on Washington and Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Got some hope from Martin Luther King's talk. Somehow we got through it by, I guess, prayer and where we stood in our faith. The school year ended with disappointment because in 1964, classroom doors to St. Paul's closed. The shutdown of Louisville's inner city Catholic schools impacting African-American students can be traced to the previous decade. Mom's alma mater, known as Catholic Colored High, closed its doors in 1956. She was in the class in 1950, and her brother Richard Dawson, who graduated in 1944, chronicled its history. They were building churches for African Americans, they were building educational institutions, and they were allowing them to, uh, you know, to go to, go to them. And uh, there was a lot of pride in, 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 in those schools. Grades two, three, and four were carried out at St. Peter Claver. Closed in 1967, an unsolved arson destroyed the classrooms in 2002. Fifth grade brought a merger of schools under the name Pope John 23rd, and classes were carried out at St. Martin's. And the next year, our consolidated operation moved blocks away to St. Boniface. During the junior high years, another merger resulting in a new move to St. Patrick's took on the name Pope John Paul. That's our basketball team that made up the final class in 1971 and took home the city championship. Trinity High School provided incomparable and prestigious underpinnings for graduation in 1975, but the three previous years were spent at a well-respected place of learning. The handwriting was kind of on the, on the wall that, you know, eventually Flaget wasn't going to be around a whole long time. Archbishop Benedict Joseph Flaget High opened in a wooden home along River Park Drive during 1942 and closed just down the block in 1974. Since then, campus classrooms have been converted into apartments. However, reflective remembrances can be found at other places of learning. One is on display at my alma mater Trinity and at St. Xavier High, which opened a museum honoring a closed school. During my freshman year, Pete Compizzi served as Dean of Students and as the last head football coach to take the Flagey Braves to a state championship title game in 1971. Oh, you're a Flagey grad. That's, uh, you know, that was a great school and uh, a lot of history, a lot of tradition, good academics. When you walked down Flagey, I mean, you felt like you had made it. You was, you was going to go on and be something. The starting quarterback on the 1971 team was John McGrath. The spirit of the school from all the years going back you know, the Harney and Schnellberg. Among the revered graduates were Heisman Award-winning quarterback Paul Horning, known for his starring roles with Notre Dame and the Green Bay Packers, along with Coach Howard Schnellenberger, who led the University of Miami to a national championship and later returned home to coach the University of Louisville to a Fiesta Bowl victory. Nothing was ever given to us here at Flash A. High School. We had to earn what we got, and we knew if we went on in life and got, us a, college, got a college education, you had an opportunity, and you had Plaza A Diploma. Boundless prestige springs from the place of learning, named after Kentucky's first Roman Catholic bishop, Benedict Joseph Flaget, who was held in very high regard. But one factoid eludes many of his admirers. Bishop Benedict Joseph Flaget of Bardstown in Louisville owned slaves. In his writings, Dr. Stephen White cuts to the chase by stating, Flaget purchased slaves for his diocese and bequeathed them to his successor, Bishop Martin John Spaulding. Some of the most distinguished of the bishops who become archbishops and cardinals, they come from a slave-owning background. Supporting documentation of what Flaget did can be found on the third floor office of the Jefferson County Clerk. It is home to the bishop's handwritten will that listed his slaves by their names, John, Charles, Edward, Mary, Samuel, and Magdalene, to name just a few of the nearly 20 African Americans he owned. How can a Catholic have slaves? How can any Christian have slaves? But they were, it was hard to, but that's, that is 
something that we probably will never understand, but it's a reality that happened. We can't ignore that. This part of the bishop's past was not shared with the Flagey students. Having participated in sports and a number of activities, comprehending the actions of this school's much beloved namesake is unsettling. There are aspects of our history that are not pretty, uh, that are traumatic, but in the end, it is also what has made us who we are today. Hosea Mitchell graduated in the last class of 1974. It was the same academic year that Flaget would take in female students from Lorena High School, which shut down in 1973. Among those who transferred was Reverend Mary Angela Stevenson Johnson. I don't see how you can read scripture and use anything in the Bible, which I would assume as a bishop or whatever, a man of God, that you could use anything in there to justify slavery. Back in Bardstown, the place he helped settle, Bishop Flagey's presence is celebrated on street signs, state-issued placards, and there's even a hospital that carries his name. Several former faculty members at the school, named in his honor, told me they had no knowledge of his slave-owning past they could share with the students. Coach Campisi did say the year that his team shared the state championship in a 6-6 tie with Thomas Jefferson, the issues and tensions of race were openly discussed in the locker room. We talk about it and it was really very enlightening to see these guys come together. Shocking and disturbing, characterized and upsetting admission made by Georgetown University. This esteemed Catholic place of learning in our nation's capital acknowledged it benefited from slave labor and sold African Americans in the 1800s as a means of keeping the school afloat. The Jesuit order and college administrators broadly and widely confirmed it was at fault for the offensive past behavior. However, this wasn't the first time institutions connected to the Catholic Church confessed to what's now being frowned upon. More than 15 years earlier, the Sisters of Charity in Nazareth near Bardstown during 2001 took a groundbreaking role by apologizing for engaging in the trade and business of handling African American lives as a commodity. The church accepted slavery but they also instructed uh, owners that they were to treat people humanely. Some of them came with the, with the students. The students would come to Nazareth and they bring their slaves with them. They worked with us in the kitchen. Uh, they worked with us helping the young girls. They worked with us in cleaning, uh, in the laundry. Certainly in the fields, we had a farm. Sister Teresa Knabel played an important role in the apology process, and her order wasn't the only group attempting to right a wrong. The Dominican Sisters of St. Catherine near Springfield, as well as the Sisters of Loretto in Marion County, also looked for forgiveness. All three groups were attempting to make amends. We probably wouldn't be where we are today if we hadn't had the help and the benefits and the culture of all these people supporting us and I hope loving us, and I hope being loved by us. The much heralded Cathedral of St. Joseph's, built in part by those who labored for free, provided a very public platform for a gesture of meaning. Inside the church walls came the words, we're sorry. I accept the apology. But I'm not so sure I have completely let it go because I have too much. It's so much there to hold on to. Before we can get to reconciliation, there has to be a sense that uh, we have both acknowledged the fact. At the final resting place where many sisters of Loretto are buried, a monument was dedicated naming the individuals of color who gave of themselves. They had to have a strong faith to, to endure what they did. To, to always be pushed to the side and not really be seen and heard, but uh, to, keep, to keep going, to stay with it, to remain uh, Catholic. 
Acknowledgement of such a past injustice comes at Nazareth by listing the names of those held in captivity near the places they built, and such a public apology resulted in this sculpture depicting the lives they led. So to me, this is their time of poetry. It was created by Louisville artist Ed Hamilton. The only way you're going to know that, that, that there's a part, that there is an aspect of an apology, unless you go there and you see a visible, tangible object that says, hey, these are the souls that built this place and we honor what their contributions was. It was beginning of the healing process. Father Chris Rhodes is the priest at Louisville's Pax Christi Collaborative. And not long after being first ordained, he was assigned to St. Joseph's Cathedral. On the front lawn are the statues of Bishop Slage and Spaulding, who engaged in what today is called human trafficking. Standing tributes also honor the legacies of Catherine Spaulding, who headed up the Sisters of Charity at Nazareth, and Father Stephen Baden, along with Father Charles Naranix. Statues of the slaveholding priests can be found at the Loretta Mother House. And now I have to work with those memories. I have to be able to understand the history, but not be angered by the history. While well-established parishes and historic religious institutions like the Abbey of Our Lady at Gethsemane, home to the Trappist monks, all validate the spiritual legacy in Kentucky's Holy Land, another well-known locale near downtown Bargetown also contributes to this community's character. Once a structure of splendor, the now decaying home known as Anatoc remains embroiled in a long-term preservation battle. Known for its opulence in better times, the plantation structure was the birthplace of one of Nelson County's best known African-American sons. Daniel Rudd was a civil rights leader, Catholic civil rights leader, who was born a slave in Bardstown, Kentucky in 1854. Gary Agee is the author of A Cry for Justice, Daniel Rudd and His Life in Black Catholicism, Journalism, and Activism. We do know that um, that his parents uh, were Catholic, his owners were Catholic. He had the basis of knowing what being owned by a family was, but he also had the opportunity to rise above that and be educated. Cincinnati, another Ohio River town, is some 140 miles away from Nelson County. It is the place where Rudd's views gained traction before an audience of black Catholics hungry for change inspiration came from a self-published American Catholic Tribune. He wrote well, I mean really well. And the circulation was wide. His newspaper received ringing endorsements from some of the church's best known decision makers of the time, including Cardinal James Gibbons of Baltimore. There were many issues that he took on, and I think one thing that we can um, recognize in terms of his legacy is the notion of a plan of action. Rudd's vision gave birth to the National Black Catholic Congress. And I think Daniel Rudd, I think uh, the Black Catholic Church is a lay church. It is not a clerical church. Some 3,000 black Catholics assembled in Orlando, Florida for the largest gathering of its kind by embracing the value of their faith for such a celebrated event that brings them together once every five years. Cardinal. Peter Turkson of Ghana among the dignitaries. Such a concept of African Americans coming together first appeared in Rudd's publication back in 1889. I often wonder what he went through to become so focused, so vocal, and so prophetic. The initial Congress was held in Washington, D.C. at St. Augustine's Parish. It attracted Father Augustus Tolson, who at the time was our nation's only black priest. Before the event ended, an invitation came from the White House. What Daniel Red created was really a national movement that was recognized by the civil government that Grover Cleveland said, I'd like to meet these men and have a conversation on what's on the agenda of black Catholics during our time period. President Grover Cleveland applauded Rudd's efforts, but back in Bardstown, he was a prophet with little honor. He really believed 
that the faith he had received was going to lead him to heaven. He came back here, he had family here, and the family knew what he had been doing at all, but he came back here and died here. In his hometown, the only noticeable place where Rudd's name shows up is the St. Joseph Cemetery. However, his social commentary has touched and moved one very important heart. He spoke out in his editorials when, when schools were discriminated. Louisville's Archbishop Joseph Kurtz applauded the words and actions of Daniel Rudd during November 2017's African American History Month celebration at St. Martin de Porres. He ended up, in a sense, giving us a vision that was a vision that was an activist, but an activist that was looking to promote a lasting harmony, not a harmony for a day, but something that would be lasting. Excellent man. Uh, faith-filled, true believer. The Kentucky native who was celebrated with other black figures of the Catholic Church never let go of one enduring principle. The Catholic Church is going to be an ally in this campaign for justice and equality, and that's important for Rudd. In the birthplace and hometown of Daniel Rudd, so make sure we take care of our babies, y'all. Hundreds return to Bargetown for the annual summertime event billed as Buttermilk Days. Known for strong ties to St. Monica's Parish and reconnecting people to their rural Catholic roots, this gathering isn't the only one of its kind in Kentucky's Holy Land. Washington County is just across the line from Nelson County, and many natives are lured back to familiar soil during the first weekend in August. Crowds flock to the homecoming picnic at Springfield, Kentucky's Holy Rosary. To see the people that come from across the country at Holy Rosary's picnic, it just, it just amazes me. From cake wheels to cornhole, a sense of belonging is felt by those connected through years of togetherness. We have people come back for homecoming if they don't come every year, they try to make it every two, every three years. Lifelong members of the parish understand such a strong emotional tug. I don't think it's because our parents and grandparents built it. Etched in the cornerstone is 1929, the year the parish opened its doors. But for many members here, a directed path to autonomy was paved with its share of obstacles. Less than two miles away, the church on the hill known as St. Rose opened in 1806, but African-American children making their first communion were treated less than fairly. Well, the black kids had to either go on the balcony or they stood in the back of the church with their little white gowns and dresses and things on. And then the priest went to the back of the church to give them their communion. They weren't allowed to come down the middle aisle with the white kids to make first communion. They made it at St. Rose but the priest went to the back to give them their communion. Go up in the balcony, you know, just sit up there, and we'll then come downstairs and we'll come back and give you communion. No, nothing precious about that at all. Nothing, the precious body and blood, nothing. Those slides help define a sense of dignity at a new place of worship. I know that it burnt in 33 and uh, they built it back, uh, but uh, this church is the first church that uh, they had here that was black church here in Springfield, First Black Catholic Church. So it's, it's, it, it, it means something to a lot of people. Aging locales that have been home to spiritual gatherings since the 1800s tower above well-traveled highways throughout this region of the Bluegrass State. Public tours showcase the early years of church history in Bardstown at places like St. Joseph's and St. Thomas. The back roads of the bluegrass are loaded with history and heritage and can impact one's own family legacy. My family's Catholic connection here in Kentucky's Holy Land goes all the way back to the 19th century. The cornerstone of the current building says 1887, but parishioners started worshiping it New Hope St. Vincent de Paul back in 1820. Father Ken Fortner is the official keeper of the congregation's records. Where are your baptisms from um, uh, 1901? In these pages, an early 20th century baptism reveals a close family connection. January 1901, 
That's the infant. Day. Wait a minute. Here it is. Look. Number three. Ethel. Ethel. Ethel Lewis. Ethel Lewis. That's her. That's my grandmother. Born December 25th, 1900. Baptized January 5th, 1901. Ethel Lewis Dawson was known to family members as Eddie. And the records at the Nelson County Church go back at least two generations before she was baptized. St. Vincent de Paul was also the place of worship for her parents, Edward and Rebecca, who were born as free individuals. But the written records reveal a little known family fact. Eddie's grandparents, my great great grandparents, Spencer and Maria, who we were told went by the name Mariah, are listed on the church rolls and had a child born as a slave in 1862. Her name, Elijah Jane Lewis. For the brave and courageous individuals who survived such an uncomfortable period of American history, simple truths can be realized that faith at these places they built offered a gateway to freedom. They were a part of the, the religion of the master. <laughs> From church sponsor community celebrations to Sunday morning services, a single tie binds one generation to the next. We had to have great faith to stay there. Such a reminder of enduring staying power comes to us from the Dixie Hibbs book centering on the history of St. Joseph's Cathedral. One image stamped in 1916 showcases a 100th anniversary photo of worshipers at the church. But at the back of this gathering near the column stands a group of African Americans, believed to be by some, former slaves. It's special to be a part of that legacy of uh, first generation uh, Catholics here in uh, Nelson County in Kentucky. Those ancestors that uh, we need to remember. It certainly does raise some questions in the minds and hearts of the Catholics of the Archdiocese of Louisville and certainly the clergy of the Archdiocese of Louisville. Long before the vestiges of government-ordered segregation were legally removed by congressional measures such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, churches across Louisville's archdiocese began integrating its pews. Suburban locales like St. Bartholomew were among the first. And following the city's 1968 riots, which eventually led to white flight, Inner city parishes such as Christ the King became largely African American. Nobody knew, you know, how did these Catholics become Catholic? And it's all emanated down in Barstow, in Nelson County, and those places. Back in the Holy Land, documented sacrifices of their unpaid contributions were hard to come by. Masses first began at St. Michael's in the Nelson County community of Fairfield during 1792. That's where slaves are known to be buried in unmarked graves and placed in a segregated part of the cemetery. At Lebanon St. Augustine Cemetery, one headstone mentions individuals of color by the first names of James, Sarah, Pius, and Mary. It goes on to list members of the Spalding family by their first and last names. The first uh, apology came with a group of sisters that were sincerely giving a thought about what had happened with the slaves at Nazareth. Standing memorials and symbols of chiseled recognition at places like Nazareth can and do educate the public. The intent of honoring the disenfranchised is clear, but owning up to the past doesn't always take away the pain. Just ask Sister Pauline Albin at the Loretta Mother House. What I know I am a part of is the white supremacy sin. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. However, the years of unrewarded of efforts land. that were rarely, if ever, applauded have resulted in present day empowerment. Body of Christ. Individuals like Father Anthony Chandler offer a living example of progress by demonstrating the possible. His personal commitment is largely based on the teachings of the Catholic Church. We believe this to be true, and we believe that this is our way to salvation. 
I mean, that's the bottom line. Why do I get up and do what I do every day? That's the very reason why I do it. From the small town places of worship to well-established parishes across the Commonwealth's largest city, understanding the pain of the past inspires a sense of pride and hope for the future. It's special to be a part of that legacy. Such a legacy is rooted in the virtues of positive prayer and spiritual perseverance. And they kept the faith and they passed it on to us. According to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, there is an estimated three million black Catholics here in America. The number in Louisville's archdiocese, somewhere around 20,000. Going back more than 200 years, the early, bold, and courageous pioneers whose shoulders so many of us stand upon passed an amazing torch as well as an enduring legacy that has allowed so many of us to move forward by our own faith. That's facing an uncomfortable truth, bluegrass roots and Catholic realities. From St. Martin de Porres in Louisville, Kentucky, I'm Steve Crump. Thanks so much for joining us.